there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and under her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. Having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and cast them down to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto Yah, into his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared of Yahuwah, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great red dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him, and a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our Yah and the power of his Christ for the accuser of the brethren is cast down which accuses him before Yah day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time left. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of Yahuwah, and have the testimony of Yahusha Hamashiach. The Children of Israel A people of warriors and kings From the very beginning, from out of Egypt They were a nation of warriors, a great army Who slayed the Nephilim in the land of Canaan Conquering both man, beast, and the sea of the fallen angels. The children of Jerusalem won many great battles. However, they also suffered great defeats. In fact, Jerusalem was conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and Jerusalem was also conquered by the Romans. With the defeat of the house of Judah, the descendants of King David were scattered. However, there was one place where the descendants of the royal house of King David, where the sons of King David himself 
were gathered together. Let's take a look at the sons of the royal house of King David. King Dawid, one of the great kings of Israel. King Dawid was a man after Yah's own heart, and he was a great warrior. Acts chapter 13, verse 22 reads, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto him Dawid to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found Dawid, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath Yah, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a savior, Yahusha Hamashiach. First Samuel chapter 18, verse seven reads, and the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and Dawid his ten thousands. The Most High Yah also made a promise to King Dawid's son, King Solomon, that if he walked in his ways as King Dawid did, that he too would be blessed. First Kings chapter three, verse 12 reads, Behold, I have done according to your words. Lo, I have given you a wise and an understanding heart, that there was none like you before you, neither after you shall any arise like unto you. And I have also given you that which you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father Dawid did walk, then I will lengthen your days. You see, one of the reasons King Dawid was special was because he was obedient to the Most High Yah. So much so that the Most High Yah used King Dawid as an example for other kings to follow. 1 Kings chapter 14 verse 7 reads, Go tell Jeroboam, Thus says Yah, Elohim of Israel, For as much as I exalted you from among the people, and made you prince over my people Israel, and rinsed the kingdom away from the house of Dawid, and gave it to you, and yet you have not been as my servant Dawid who kept my commandments, who followed me with all his heart to do that which was right in my eyes. It was under King Dawid and his son King Solomon that Yisrael was blessed and prosperous. Some would even call it the golden age of Yisrael. Monuments, cranial analysis, ancient descriptions, DNA, and first hand accounts all point to an unavoidable truth that the Spanish and Portuguese brews were black.
As the following reference reads, and it reads, On entering Portugal from Spain, the traveler is forcibly struck with the difference between the two countries. The dark eyes, the black hair, and brown complexion are the only traits of resemblance between the Portuguese and Spaniards. The Portuguese have thick lips, noses something of the Negro form, black and often curly hair, and their figures and above all, their hands show signs of the mixed blood. In Spain, the people, in spite of their dark complexion, and eyes have at least a European look. On entering Portugal, the traveler is, however, agreeably surprised by finding himself among a more cultivated people. And the next reference reads, and it reads, King John II in 1492 expelled all the Jews to the island of St. Thomas, which had been discovered in 1471 and to other Portuguese settlements on the continent of Africa. And from these banished Jews, the black Portuguese or the Negro Portuguese, as they are called, and the Jews in the Wango, who are despised even by the very Negroes, are descended. In other words, the brews that were sent to the west coast of Africa were descended from Negroes. And the next reference reads, Jews, the name given to the Hebrews after their return from their captivity in Babylon. They are a religious people fond of home and their children, shrewd in money matters and intellectual. In form and feature, they are short with dark hair and eyes, a swarthy complexion, full lips, and a characteristic nose. And the next reference reads, are Jews white like you? No, replied I, rather more like yourself, very dark. And the next reference reads and reads, thus the black color is found not only in individuals as the black Jews of Portugal, but in the tribes as the Bicaris on the Red Sea, whose hair and character are perfectly Semitic. And now let's take a look at the Bicaris people who have the same black color found in the Jews of Portugal. And yes, as you can see, they are a black Negro people. And on to our next reference, which reads, he was of a middle size. He had good features in his face, the skin somewhat black, black curly hair, long eyebrows, and of the same color, so that one might easily know by his looks that he was descended from Portuguese Jews. And the next reference reads, the Spanish Jew is always dark complexion. And another reference reads, "'Tis also a vulgar error that the Jews are all black, for this is only true of the Portuguese Jews, who marrying always among one another, beget children like themselves, and consequently the swarthiness of their complexion is entailed upon their whole race, even in the northern regions." It's important to note that not only do old references confirm Spanish and Portuguese brews are black, we also have supporting archeological evidence such as cranial analysis performed on skulls of ancient Spanish and Portuguese brews. Evidence identifies Spanish and Portuguese brew skulls as dolicocephalic, which is the description of the Negro skull today. As the following reference reads, and it reads, Anthropologists are accustomed to dividing it into two parts well distinguished, the doliocosephalic and the brachiocosephalic. To the first type, which is the doliocosephalic, belong the Sephardim Jews, the Spanish and Portuguese brews, even the larger part of the Jews of Italy and southern France. 
an avalanche of evidence makes the description of Spanish and Portuguese brews being black a far gone conclusion. These brews were the same brews that were taken by King Nebuchadnezzar into Spain in roughly 597 BC. Another group of captive nobles from Jerusalem were taken in 70 AD, the day General Titus burned the city of Jerusalem to the ground. Now, you need to know that back then, Jerusalem was inhabited by a special people, a people endowed with mm, certain powers. I guess you could call them, how should I say, superheroes. Or you could call them Yasabim, Eleazar, Samath, Abishai, Debor, Benaiah, and Asahel. And when they worked together, no nation could stand before them. But unfortunately, on that day, their bands of brotherhood were broken. And they fought against each other and fell under the iron boot of Rome. indeed the beginning of the time of the Gentiles. The descendants of Rome burned the Most High Yah's holy city to the ground. Nothing was spared and not one stone was left upon another. The blood of Judah and Jerusalem ran through the streets. Two-thirds would perish by the fire and the sword, and one-third would go into captivity. As spoken by Hamashiach, the prophecy had come to pass. Then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And so the brews were taken to Spain and Portugal by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and General Titus of Rome. Both groups of brews were royal blood descendants of King David. As the following reference reads, and it reads, the Spanish Jews maintained that they had been transported hither after the destruction of the temple by the Babylonian conqueror, Nebuchadnezzar. And the next reference reads, The Roman governor of Spain begged the conqueror of Jerusalem to send him some noble families from the capital of Judea, and Titus complied with the request. So we see the footsteps of the sons of King David 
made its way to Spain and Portugal, where they lived for over 1,000 years. Ironically, it's here in Spain and Portugal where we witness an amazing transformation of the sons of King David. It's here that the sons of King David transformed themselves into a people called Negroes. It began when a Brew and his family and their descendants began calling themselves Negroes in the 11th and 12th centuries. And yes, these are the Negroes, as prophecy states, who are scattered to the four corners of the world. Make way, make way for the blues, make way. The royal blues coming through today. Sons of the people from the world, call your chauffeur, call your king, be ready and all. Oh, oh. Make way. Let the Bible say what this wicked world decrees of people trodden down who they always want to keep a name. Way. But the time has come for all those in the world to see the chains being broken. Spirit, mind, soul, set free. A Negro, a Negro. I said, come on, watch that to my Negro. Praise them old cycles, we's about to go. Once they found out more about these Negroes, said a Negro, a Negro. I said, come on, watch that to my Negro. Praise them old cycles, we's about to go. Once they found out more about these Negroes. In 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella issued an edict to expel the Jews. They were banished from Portugal, Spain. And for their faith, they were treated inhumane. This kicked off the Atlantic slave trade. Our history, they try to erase. This fulfilled Deuteronomy 28. Every single curse is black Hebrews living every day. Let the Bible see what this wicked world decrees of people trodden down who they always want to keep a need. But the time has come for all those in the world to see the chains being broken. Spirit, mind, soul set free. A Negro, a Negro. I said, come on, what's that to my Negro? Praise the old cycles, we's about to go. Once they found out more about these Negroes, said a Negro, a Negro. I said, come on, what's that to my Negroes? Praise the old cycles, we's about to go. Now, about those Negroes. We previously pointed out that, according to the Webster Dictionary, the word Negro did not refer to a person of African descent until after the year 1555, which means that slaves called Negroes before the year 1555 were not African. This was confirmed by Spanish law, which required Negro slaves shipped to the New World. They had to have been born in Spain. And remember, these Negroes who were born in Spain were under the curses of Deuteronomy 28 because they chose to follow the oral laws of the Talmud instead of the written laws of the Most High Yah. If thou will not hearken unto the voice of Yah thy Elohim, to observe to do all his commandments and statutes which I command thee this day, then you will be cursed. Shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen 
and bond women, and no man shall redeem them. Whoa, 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 whoa. As the curses overtook the sons of King David in Spain and Portugal, the persecutions broke out against the Bruce. The first persecutions broke out against the Bruce by their Muslim neighbors, followed by persecutions by Christian conquerors of Spain and Portugal. In fact, when the Christian Catholics took over Spain, they gave the Bruce an ultimatum, convert to Christianity or die. Revelations 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of Yah, and have the testimony of Yahusha Hamashiach. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. The Gentile church used their version of the Bible and the sword to conquer the house of Judah. Then after conquering Judah, they set fire to the world. Go! Leave no stone unturned. For your heavenly sea, the Pope, has given this land unto you. You need only take it and enslave and destroy any who oppose you. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brother. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. In this sign you shall conquer. Conquer. The Jews and Moors in Spain, page 214, and it reads, The king's creed awoke again simultaneously with the reawakening of his greed. He issued an edict which threw even that of Torquemada in the shade. All Jewish children below 14 years of age were torn from their parents' arms, dragged into the church, baptized. Those under three years of age were given to Christians to receive a Christian education, or in other words, to be raised as slaves. Those between three and 10 years of age were put on board of a ship conveyed to the newly discovered unwholesome island of St. Thomas, called the Isles of Perdition, which was colonized by Portuguese condemned criminals or Portuguese Jews condemned by the Inquisition to fare there as best they could. Those between 10 and 14 years were sold as slaves. Then indeed the cup of their affliction was full to the brim. It was a stern truth in which Lemieux uttered when he said, the Jews have experienced fully the unequal skill of the church in administering pain. Mothers cast themselves at the feet of the tyrants and pitifully begged to be taken with their babies. They were heartlessly thrust aside. Hundreds of mothers, mad with despair, ran behind the ships as they carried off the idols of their heart and perished in the waves. The serene fortitude which the exiled people had borne so many and such grievous calamities, gave way at last and was replaced by the wildest paroxysms of despair. Piercing shrieks of anguish filled the land, childless and heartbroken and brokenhearted. They now sought to leave the land, but they were told that they had forfeited their right and they were given the choice between baptism
and slavery. Thousands after enduring all that they did, after leaving the beloved Spain and all their wealth and ease submitted to baptism now in the hope of being reunited with their children. Thousands were sold as slaves. Yet prior to being sold, they were submitted to tortures, cruelties, outrageous too revolting, too repulsive, too heartbreaking to be here narrated. Now to pause here just for a moment, just keep in mind that these were black Portuguese and Spanish Jews, as the previous references have pointed out. All right, as we continue, terror seized upon the native Portuguese Jews when they helplessly beheld the cruelties to which their Spanish brethren were subjected. They knew then themselves could not escape the wrath of the church much longer. They thought of flight and well had it been for them had they made their escape then. While they were making secret preparations, John II died, 1495. He had been afflicted on the very day when the ships laden with the Jewish exile children set sail for the isle of the condemned criminals with a strange, painful malady and had lingered ever since. So King John II, who shipped the children of the Jews to the west coast of Africa, became sick the very day that the ships departed from Portugal. Let's keep reading. It says, His own promising son and successor preceded him into the grave. His cousin, Manuel, ascended the throne. He was the counterpart of his predecessor, kind-hearted, a promoter of learning, eager to further the interests of his country by discoveries abroad and by commerce at home. Immediately, he disenfranchised the Jewish exiles sold into slavery, promised to recall the condemned children, and issued an edict in which he commanded kind treatment to the Jews and prohibited accusations against them. In their great joy, the native Portuguese Jews sent an embassy to him, offering him large sums of money, voluntarily, as a token of their gratitude. The king thanked them, reassured them of his goodwill, but refused to be paid for human kindness. But again had destiny decreed that a woman was to play an ignoble part in the tragic history of the Jews. A marriage was proposed between Manuel of Portugal and the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabel of Spain. Manuel was rejoiced with the proposal. Already he saw himself in the near future king of United Spain and Portugal and of the entire New World. But Satan stepped between, dipped his pen in gall, and writing the marriage contract, demanded as one of the conditions the immediate expulsion from Portugal of all the Jews, both natives, which is the Portuguese, and exiles, which were the Spanish. The king hesitated. The fanatical daughter of the fanatical parents persisted. Argument made her more vehement. Torquemada might as well be proud of his pupil. The possession of vast empires and of the most powerful crown of Europe tempted and the temper conquered. He had purchased his right to the princess of Spain at a sacrifice of thousands and thousands of lives. And with the destruction of the very pillars of his nation's prosperity. On the 30th of November, 1497, the marriage contract was signed. And on the 20th of the following month appeared the edict of the expulsion of the Jews from Portugal. The scene of mourning and wailing, heartrending cries which resounded in Spain re-echoed in Portugal, only the more painful because of the terrible knowledge that they had since acquired of the meaning of the word expulsion. Manuel soon regretted his signing away his most industrious 
most intelligent and most prosperous citizens. But the marriage contract held him fast. And the Spanish queen kept a watchful eye on him and Torquemada upon both. The prospective vast empire and Spanish crown still dazzled his eyes. He planned a strategy. He thought he could force the parents to embrace Christianity and to remain if he once succeeded in getting all their children into his power and into the Christian faith. He gave secret orders for the repetition of the atrocious crime of having all children under 14 years of age seized from their mother's bosom and father's arm, dispersed through the kingdom to be baptized and brought up as Christians. The secret became known. Portugal again re-echoed the wails of stricken ones. Frantic mothers threw their children into deep wells or rivers. Mothers were known to take their babies from their breasts and tear them limb from limb. Rather than resign them to Christians, they would rather know the bodies of their children in the grave and their released spirit in heaven than have them adopt a faith into which Satan sent his friends. With all the parents' opposition, the king's order was executed. Many accepted baptism, but not enough to please the king, and to wreak vengeance upon them for thwarting his wishes, he revoked his edict, seized all who had not yet fed, and sold them for slaves. The Jews. The Jews are composed of three or four separate racial elements. The Asiatic Negroid strain shows itself occasionally with the curly hair, the long eye, and proportions of the skull. The Jewish hybrids with the Negro in Jamaica and Guana reproduce most strikingly the Assyrian. You see, Jews were called Negro, which is the Spanish and Portuguese word for black. Both Spanish and Portuguese Jews were called black Jews. For example, in this quote it reads, King John II in 1492 expelled all the Jews to the island of St. Thomas, which had been discovered in 1471, and to other Portuguese settlements on the continent of Africa. And from these banished Jews, the black Portuguese, as they are called. It reads, thus the black color is found not only in individuals, as the black Jews of Portugal. And it reads, "'Tis also a vulgar error that the Jews are all black, for this is only true of the Portuguese Jews, who marrying always among one another, beget children like themselves. And consequently, the swarthiness of their complexion is entailed upon their whole race, even in the northern regions." Now notice how first-hand accounts line up with Bible verses, such as Lamentations, chapter 5, verse 10, where it reads, Our skin is black like another because of the terrible famine. Now, not only did Europeans refer to the Jews as black, 
Arabs also referred to the Jews as black. Now, the Arab word for black is referred to as Sudan, S-U-D-A-N. The following references read, the Arabic word for blacks is Sudan. And then the reference at the bottom reads, they call it Balad Sudan, which means land of the blacks. Sudan is the Arabic word for black person. Now notice that Sudan is spelled two different ways. S-U-D-A-N is the modern day spelling. However, the antiquity spelling was S-O-U-D-A-N, so Udan, which is simply two words combined into one, so Udan. Now, let's use Google Translate to look up the meaning of the words so Udan. Now, we will use Hausa language, which is located in the So Yudan, to translate the word Yudan. Now, let's take a quick look at the Hebrew meaning of the words, so, Yudan. After all, Hebrew is the native tongue of the Jews. To do this, we will start with Strong's Concordance, H5471. That's Strong's word, H5471, which is so. And if we look at the definition of the word so, it reads, of foreign origin. That's of foreign origin. And if we put that together, we look at the Hebrew translation. So means foreigner or of foreign origin. And Yudan equals Judah, which is H3063, which represents the southern kingdom. And if you put the two together, you get foreigners of Judah. So on our map, we have so Yudan, which in Hebrew represents the Foreigners of Judah. Now, let's cross-check our Google Translation findings using additional references. For example, the index in the back of the Talmud, Volume 3, reads, Yudan, a variant of Judah in the 4th century. And our next reference reads, Yudan equals Judah. Now, let's take a look at additional references to see exactly who lived in the Seoul Yudan. The Jews. The Jews of Seoul Yudan are, according to my informers, divided into many large and small tribes, with whose names they are unacquainted. Their mode of life in some countries is pastoral. But the towns are filled with traders and artificers of that faith who gain a substance at their 
several employments in the service of the Muslims, under whose government they live as vassals. This in reference to Mr. Bagwich's kingdom of Yehudi. I may be permitted to say is the only state of society in which that oppressed nation is suffered to live. And the tribes without security in their possessions, without public revenue or arms, are hourly exposed to insult and rampant form of blind zeal. An act of bigotry by which their lords are animated in those countries, the lands occupied by those people cover a wide extent between Messina and Cabin. They are said to be mingled also with the upper Fula tribes, eastward of Timbuktu, and in many parts of Maror. They have inheritance or are employed as artificers in the cities and towns. As we live among the heathens, says Bashan, so do the Jews in Maroa and Fulani with our brethren, but they are not esteemed like us. For they are a people hardened in their sins and obstinate in their fidelity. The anger of Yah is upon them, and therefore are they given to the rule of the Muslims. The Arab Bashar goes on to describe the Jews as brown colored instead of the black color of the Ashanti. The Arabic word so Yudan and the word Negro, which is the Portuguese and Spanish word for black, were by words that were used to describe the Jews or the house or tribe of Judah. Now, this was foretold in Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 37 where it reads and thou shalt become an astonishment a proverb and a byword among all nations whether yah shall lead thee a long long time ago when the power of the pope reigned supreme the one who calls himself the replacement of Christ saw the religion of the rebellious house of Judah spreading throughout his dominion. And in order to put a stop to these commandment keepers, he created the Inquisition. And the following quote reads, King Emmanuel was succeeded by John III in 1521, who observing that Judaism spread greatly in his time, that the Jews publicly professed their errors and taught them others, that his domestic servants, not only such as proceeded from them, but those who were ancient Christians were infected with the poison of their doctrine condemned the sacraments of the church, did not receive them in the article of death, treated with great irreverence, holy images, and especially some of the virgin mother of God. The lady of angels, they are the words of Sosa. Considering these things in his mind, he desired of Pope Clement VII, the holy tribunal of the inquisition, in his kingdom and although this pope for a long while and oftentimes refused it through the vigorous endeavors of the jews who to their utmost opposed the royal petition for the jews always hated this holy tribunal as others do to this day for what reason they know best yet at length with difficulty he granted it in the form of law. January 16th, 1531. All right. Now, the Inquisition was the Pope's police, judge, jury, and executioner 
all rolled up into one institution. Their primary focus was to stamp out all remnants of the religion of the rebellious house of Judah. To carry out this purpose, the Pope outlawed all practices or beliefs that he, being the so-called replacement of Christ, did not create, authorize, or approve. Let's take a closer look at the things outlawed by the Pope and the Inquisition. And the following reference reads, And first, if you know or have heard that any man or woman have kept or observed any Sabbath according to the rites, ceremonies, and observances of the law of Moses, and on the said days have put on clean a fresh shirt and other garments, or better, handsomer and holy clothes, or have laid clean napkins on the table and clean sheets on the bed in honor of the said Sabbath, or have not blown up or nor kindled their fire, or have abstained from all their work on the said Sabbath, and begun to keep them from Friday evening, or who have celebrated the Passover of unleavened bread, beginning this sort of food with lettuce, parsley, and other green herbs, or have observed the Passover of tabernacles by fixing up green burrows or rich tapestry, feasting and accepting each other's invitation to eat and drink, or if they expect the Messiah promised in the law, or have said that the Messiah promised in the law is not yet come, but is to come, and that they yet expect him to deliver them from that bondage, which they say they are under, and to lead them into the promised land. And as you can see, these are just a few of the things that were outlawed by the Pope. And ironically, these are things that both Christ and the apostles observed when they walked the earth. And also, this doctrine of the Pope was an all-out assault on the laws, statutes, and commandments of the Most High. All right, well, some of the things outlawed by the Pope, by the one who calls himself the replacement of Christ, he outlaws the Most High's Sabbath, which is the fourth of the Ten Commandments, which was written by the very finger of the Most High, Yah himself. And the Pope also outlaws resting on the Sabbath as well as outlawing all of the Most High's holy days or his feast days, including Passover and Tabernacles. And finally, but not limited to, the Pope also outlaws the Jews believing that the Messiah will deliver them from their present bondage. Now, keep in mind, the Christian church led by the Pope didn't persecute the Jews because they didn't believe in Christ. Because according to references, some Jews did in fact believe in Christ. Instead, the Roman Christian church persecuted the Jews or the rebellious house of Yehuda for believing or for observing the laws, statutes, and commandments of the Most High. And in turn, they made it against the law to do so. A Jew and his wife and a daughter of about 13 years of age being condemned to be burnt while the father and mother were burning they set the child loose from its fetters and the priests got around it with a view of converting it 
by the united force of their rhetoric and the terrors of immediately undergoing the same cruel death. The child, after seemingly to listen for a while to their origin, gave her answer by jumping into the flame. This heroic act of a 13-year-old girl shocked the people attending the Alto de Fe to its core that her sacrifice shut down the Alto de Fe in Madrid for 12 years. No one knows how many lives her selfless act saved for those 12 years. However, we do know that she cherished the laws, statutes, and commandments of the Most High Yah above life itself. Israel, these are your forefathers. take a quick look at our timeline. Around 33 AD, the children of Judah had given Yahshua over to the Red Dragon to be killed by Roman crucifixion. After the Messiah's death and resurrection, the Red Dragon destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD along with destroying the Most High's Temple. Rome raised the Most High's Temple to the ground. The children of Judah were then persecuted mercilessly by the Red Dragon. And around 321 AD, the Red Dragon seized control of the Christian Church when the Roman Emperor Constantine was made the head of the Christian Church. It was at this time the Red Dragon began changing the Most High's laws, statutes, and commandments. For example, the Emperor of Rome established Sunday as the new day of rest and outlawed observing the Most High Yah's laws, statutes, and commandments. Around 711 AD, the Muslims, Saracens, and Jews conquered Spain and Portugal. Led by Commander Tariq ibn Zayyad, for a time the Jews lived peaceably with their Muslim brothers in Spain and Portugal. The children of Judah from around the region flooded into Spain and Portugal. However, as time passed on, the Talmud was introduced to the Jews of Spain and Portugal. This caused the children of Judah to follow after the traditions of men, instead of following after the laws, statutes, and commandments of the Most High Yah. This caused the Jews of Spain and Portugal to be placed under a curse. This is when the Red Dragon repaid the Jews and the Muslims back for his defeat in 711 AD in Spain and Portugal. The Red Dragon began laying the foundation for the Inquisition and the transatlantic slave trade. The Red Dragon issued a series of palpable bulls and edicts or decrees that would raise the level of Judah's persecution to new heights for many years to come. These decrees and palpable bulls would send the children of Judah to the four corners of the world as slaves. It would also kill the men and women of Judah who would not forfeit the Most High's laws, statutes, and commandments of the Most High Yah. And last but not least, these palpable bulls would spread the Red Dragon's version of Christianity around the world. 
The red dragon would use its power to deceive the whole world. Let's take a closer look. Judah has fallen. All seem lost. Or so it seemed. The children of Judah had indeed been sent into slavery and sent to the shores of West Africa. As the following reference reads, and it reads, large numbers of Jews were expelled from Portugal and taken to the coast of Southern Guinea, which is the coast of West Africa. And let's not forget that these Jews were indeed called black or Negro, Portuguese as the following reference reads and it reads King John II in 1492 expelled all the Jews to the island of St. Thomas which had been discovered in 1471 into other Portuguese settlements on the continent of Africa and from these banished Jews the black Portuguese or the Negro Portuguese as they are called and once placed on the west coast of Africa these Negro Portuguese were sold into slavery for it reads during the first days of the slave trade from 16 to 18,000 were annually transported from Ajuda as the Portuguese called this place. Once placed on the west coast of Africa, these Negro Portuguese were sold into slavery. As the reference reads, it reads that the said king sold all those Jews for slaves. But why and how did this happen? How did the children of Judah fall so low? To answer this question, we need to go back to the beginning of the conquest of Spain and Portugal by the Moors and the Jews in 711 AD. When the Jews and Moors swept through the Iberian Peninsula defeating the Goths, with their victory, the Moors and Jews ruled the Iberian Peninsula for almost 800 years. The Jews enjoyed peace and prosperity as they followed the laws, statutes, and commandments of the Most High Yah. That is, until someone showed up with a new doctrine. Congratulations on your victory. And now, let me teach you about the Tahu. Let me teach you how to worship Hashem, my brother. Who was this shadowy figure pushing the doctrine of the Talmud? <laughs> well, who teaches the doctrine of the Talmud today? And it reads, The Talmud, however, was so little known in Spain that they were obliged to send deputies to the Babylonian academies to decide the disputes which rose among them. Yahshua warned of this doctrine of men 
which if followed would cause Judah to turn away from the Most High Yah's laws. And unfortunately, Judah took the bait. They began following the Talmud in Spain and Portugal. This would soon lead to Judah's demise. And it reads, And he said unto them, And full well you reject the commandment of Yah, that you may keep your own tradition. The interval of tranquility which the Jews enjoyed was about the middle of the 11th century. Disturbed by an unfortunate event, Joseph Halalevi, a learned and zealous rabbi, assisted by the Arabic version of the Talmud. <laughs> the Jews began to be persecuted by the Moors and eventually persecuted by the church. Now keep in mind that the church during this time isn't the church or assembly found in the Bible or in the New Testament. This was a new Gentile-led church. What is a Hebrew Israelite? Hebrew Israelites are the Most High Yah's chosen set-apart people. We are descended from Noah's son, Ship. Our forefathers are Abraham, Isaac, and Yegob, whose name was later changed to Yisrael. And Jacob had 12 sons who later fathered the 12 tribes of Yisrael. The 12 sons are known as Benjamin, Yosef, Naphtali, Asher, Gad, Dan, Issachar, Zebulon, Judah, Levi, Simeon, and Reuben. Now, let's review a few notable Hebrew Israelites of the Bible, such as King Saul and the Apostle Paul, Joseph and Samson, Aaron and Moses, King David, King Solomon, and of course, our Messiah, Yahshua Hamashiach, or Hamashiach, along with the 12 apostles, which made up the leadership of the church throughout the entire New Testament. They were all Hebrews, all Israelites. And regarding Yahshua, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14 reads, For it is evident that our Hamashiach, our Messiah, sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moshe spake nothing concerning the priesthood. Again, from Yahshua to the apostles, they were all Hebrews. They were all Israelites. In fact, throughout the entire New Testament, the leadership team, the head leadership team of the church consisted solely of Hebrews and of Israelites. It wasn't until the fourth century when the leadership team of the church changed dramatically to something never before seen in both the Old or New Testament. In the fourth century, after the death of the Messiah, we have a Roman emperor, Emperor Constantine, become the head or the leadership of the church. For the first time ever, we have a Roman Gentile seated at the head of the church, along with Roman bishops. We also see similar setup in the modern day churches. Modern day churches recognize Roman Gentile church fathers, such as Martin Luther or John Calvin. This too deviates from the church leadership seen in the New Testament. 
which was all Hebrews, all Israelites. Once in power, we see these two Roman Gentile led churches openly persecute the Hebrews and the Israelites. In other words, after the Roman Gentiles took over the leadership of the church, the Roman Gentile led church openly persecuted and enslaved and killed the children of Israel. Gentile church enslaved the Hebrew Israelites by promoting a doctrine of lawlessness. The Roman Gentile church taught the children of Israel that they were free from the law, that they no longer had to follow the laws, statutes, and commandments of the Most High Yah, all while enslaving them. Be free. Be the law. You don't read. Yeshua said, lay them sins on free, no need to do it. Now be free. Now put your shackles on your hands and your feet and your ass. I don't need. Yeshua said, lay them sins on me, no need to do it. Now be free. Now put your shackles on your hands and your feet and your ass. Be free. 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 Be free.
Gentile church taught that the laws, statutes, and commandments of the Most High Yah were done away with. They also taught that the Hebrew Israelites were done away with, all while actively attempting to do away with the Hebrew Israelites through slavery and persecution. And finally, the Roman Gentile church attempted to change the name of the Messiah changing it from Yahshua to Jesus or Jesus. Again, this wasn't done by the Jews nor the Greeks in the New Testament. This was done years later under the direction of the Roman Gentile church. And it reads, divine prophecy declares that the Jews shall continue a distinct people scattered among the Gentiles until the conversion of Israel to the Messiah, while they yet shall endure persecution. The Roman Catholics, ignorant of the nature of the Gospels, have endeavored wholly to destroy this people or to compel them to profess the Christian faith. Edicts the most severe and cruel have been published against them from time to time by different popes in France and Spain. They have been oppressed, fined, banished, unless they would turn Christians. Thousands of them in Spain and Portugal have professed the name of Christ to escape punishment, yet in heart remaining Jews, abhorring the idolatry of the papist. The inquisitors proceeded against them, therefore, as heretics and apostates. They are condemned by the inquisitors to endure various punishments, according to the nature or degree of the alleged crimes, as privation of all intercourse with Jews, penalties, public whipping, and burning at the stake. The nation of the Jews, after the destruction of the city and temple of Jerusalem, were brought into miserable bondage and captivity, and dispersed throughout the whole world. But being impatient of their miseries, they have often taken up arms and endeavored to assert their liberties. But having been subdued by most grievous slaughters, they have at length laid down their fierceness and are forced to bear the yoke. The Christians, partly through fear of the rage of the Jews and partly through the intemperate zeal of Christianity, have endeavored either wholly to destroy by various miseries these dispersed people or to tire them out by the grievous and length of their miseries and thus to compel them to profess the Christian faith.
Upon this account, various edicts have at different times proceeded against the Jews. Some have prescribed them in the countries where they are lived, others have deprived them of their liberties and reduced them to slavery. Others have stripped them of these advantages and privileges which their other subjects have enjoyed, that by these means they might at length be wholly extinguished or wearied out by the miseries they endured for their Judaism. Renounce it and embrace the Christian religion. Very severe edicts have been made against them, especially in Spain, where a very large number of them dwelt and were thought to endanger the safety of the kingdom. Who exactly were these Jews who were sent into captivity to the four corners of the earth? The scripture specifically tells us it was the children of Judah who would go into slavery. Now, taking a closer look at the circumstances, we see why it had to be the children, as the prophets prophesied. Slavery, with all its disadvantages, gave the Negro race by way of recompense one great consolation, namely the Christian religion and the hope and belief in a future life. The slave to whom on this side of the grave the door of hope seemed closed learned from Christianity to lift his face from earth to heaven and that made his burden lighter. In the end, the hope and the aspiration of the race and slavery fixed themselves on the vision of the resurrection with his long white robes and golden slippers. This hope and this aspiration, which are the theme of so many of the old Negro hymns, found expression in the one institution that slavery permitted to the Negro people, the Negro church. It was natural and inevitable that the Negro church coming into existence as it did under slavery should be permitted the religious life of the Negro to express itself in ways almost wholly detached from morality. There was little in slavery to encourage the sense of personal responsibility. And it reads, in the Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, and Episcopal churches, the colored people during the service sit in a particular part of the house. Now generally known as the Negro pew, they are not permitted to sit in any other nor hire or purchase pews as other people, nor would they be permitted to sit, even if invited in the pews of white persons. The Roman Gentile church was not only Judah's teachers of Roman Christianity, they were also their slave owners. And it reads, there are in the United States about 2,487,113 slaves and 386,069 free people of color. Of the slaves, 80,000 are members of the Methodist Church, 80,000 of the Baptist Church, and about 40,000 of other churches. These church members have no exemption from being sold by their owners as other slaves are. Instances are not rare, in other words, it's common, for slave holding members of churches selling slaves who are members of the same church with themselves. And members of churches have followed the business of slave auctioneers. In some of the older slave states, as Virginia and South Carolina, churches in their corporate character hold slaves, who are generally hired out for the support of the minister. 
The following is taken from the Charleston Courier of February 12th, 1835 and reads on Tuesday the 17th instant will be sold at the north of the exchange at 10 o'clock a prime gang of 10 Negroes accustomed to the culture of cotton and provisions belonging to the independent church in Christ Church Parish So, some Negroes fled from Spain and went directly into North Africa. And from there, they moved deeper into the interior, past the Sahara Desert, and settled in a place called Negroland, also called Soudan, also called Lamland. And the sons of King Dawid had returned to the continent they left long, long ago. And indeed, the sons of King Dawid had returned. Now, let's review the different names of the sons of King Dawi. And for this, we will review a reference which shows the progression of King Dawi's son's name over the years. For example, we know that the Portuguese and Spanish Jews were once called Black Portuguese or Negro Portuguese. These were the children of the Jews who had fled into Portugal. And in particular, these were the Jews who fled from Spain in 1492 by way of the expulsion edict of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel. And then last but not least, we see these black Portuguese Jews descended from Negroes. It goes from black Portuguese to Jews 
to Spanish Jews to Negroes. Who were the Negroes in 1492? Who were the Negroes called Black Portuguese? Who were the Negroes called Jews and were later expelled to Africa? Answer, these were the descendants of Yahya, the sons and daughters of King Dawi. Let's take a closer look at the home of the Negroes in Africa called Negroland. The question is, where did the Negroes of Negroland come from? Let's see if we can find the answer. As the following reference reads, and it reads, the Negroes proceed from the Soudan or Negroland and are the objects of a lucrative trade. They are a degree higher as a caste here than in America. The Imperial family or the royal family is mulatto and the moros de rey are mostly black at tatum tangier and other cities of the north coast there are still many moorish families who speak spanish and are descendants of those who were expelled after the capture of granada which is spain now notice these Negroes were expelled from Granada in 1492. The question would be who lived in Granada in 1492? As the following reference reads and reads, King Alfonso whence we may learn if we can believe it, that a king of Spain had assisted Nebuchadnezzar in reducing Jerusalem, brought an enormous population into Spain, all from either the family of Dawid or at least from the tribe of Judah, and that the royal family resided first in Seville, then in Granada. We see the sons of King Dawid lived in Granada. The Negroes living in Negroland came from Granada and the Negroes living in Negroland were said to be Jews. As the following reference reads and it reads, the natives of Lam Lam, which is another name for Negroland, are Jews. And the reference goes on to refer to these Jews as Negroes. Now let's go on to see what happened to these Negroes or these Jews living in Lam Lam or Negroland. And it reads, the people of Sala or Bersia and the Tukur make predatory incursions into the land of Lam Lam and carry away its inhabitants captive to their own country where they are purchased by the merchants who travel there, who transfer them to other countries. So we see the Negroes who were expelled from Granada in 1492 fled south into Negroland or Lam Lam and they were sold into slavery. The Spanish and Portuguese Jews were transported to Africa primarily in one of four ways. Method one, they fled directly from Spain into Africa. Method two, they fled from Spain to Portugal, then into Africa. 
Method 3. They were sent by the Portuguese to work as Lancados. Method 4. They were sent by the Portuguese and Spanish governments to work as degradados or convict. The Brews that fled into Africa using methods one and two were free to observe their own religious practices. This, of course, did not sit well with the Portuguese government who complained that, and I quote, if they should go over to Africa, as it is probable they would if driven from Portugal, all hopes of their conversion would be lost. You see, the Portuguese who were accustomed to working with the Yaya Negroes and who were accustomed to the money made off of the brews didn't want to let all that black money go. And the following reference reads, and it reads, During the first 10 years, so many had quitted their native land that Emmanuel, perceiving the injury his kingdom suffered by the immigration of the most wealthy and most industrious of his population, ordered in 1507 the seizure of the persons and the confiscation of the property of all who should be found preparing to quit or leave the country. Yet, so many ventured at all hazards to abandon the Portuguese soil that in 1524, King John III found it requisite or required to renew the edict and the immigration must have continued for Dom Sebastian repeated it in 1567 and again in 1573. The Portuguese wanted desperately to retain and convert their Negroes. However, those that had escaped into Africa were beyond their grasp. Or so it seemed. is where the brews sent into Africa by method three, the Lancados, becomes part of one of the most wicked, the most evil of plans of all time. <laughs> Portugal would take the children of the sons of King Dawid by violence, some no older than a newborn baby, and they would give these children over to wicked to evil bishops and godparents to rear them in the tenets of Christianity and the ways of the empire. And these children would be raised to be the right hand of the Portuguese empire in Africa. Think about it. What happens to a child who is raised by your enemies to do the deeds of the enemy? reference reads and it reads the Castilian Jews who from poverty or any other cause had not departed at the limited time the king ordered should be taken for slaves according to the terms of their entrance and distributed them to whomever asked for them his inhumanity did not cease here he tore young children from them and had them baptized being at the time desirous of peopling his newly discovered acquisition on the coast of africa the island of saint thomas he sent them to it with the new governor alvera de comina so that being separated from their parents and marrying people in the island they might become good christians now, the Lancados are arguably the most dangerous to their fellow brews in Africa. And it's because they were raised by their enemies.
You can see this in this reference. They were despised by the Negroes of whom they are descended. It was son against father, king against king, all by the crafty hand of the Portuguese. This is why they say Africans sold other Africans. Well, knowing full well they kidnapped the children and taught them to do their bidding. And unfortunately, the story goes from bad to worse. Over time, the Lancados and Degradados, the convicts sent by the Inquisition, who were sent to Africa to work on the royal farms, eventually, these groups escape into the African population. Jobson described these Lancados under the name of Portingalese. I must break of a while from them and acquaint you first of another sort of people we find dwelling or rather lurking among these Mandingos, only some certain way up the river. And these are, as they call themselves, Portingalese. And some few of them seem the same. Others of them are mulattoes between black and white, but for the most part as black as the natural inhabitants. They are scattered, some two or three dwellers in a place, and are all married, or rather keep with them the country black women, of whom they beget children. Howbeit they have amongst them neither church nor friar, nor any other religious order. It doth manifestly appear that they are such as have been banished or fled away from forth either of Portugal or the isles belonging unto that government. They doth generally employ themselves in buying such commodities the country affords. References show these Lancados who were sent to Africa, marrying the Negroes who fled to Africa, specifically Negroland. As the following reference reads, and it reads, In Agrisha or Negroland, the Portuguese intermarried widely with the indigenous people, and this was not discouraged by the authorities, but on the Gold Coast, they remained in their forts and trading posts on the whole part and separate from the natives. In Negrisha or Negroland, the Portuguese entered into friendly relations with Negro princes upon terms of equality. But on the Gold Coast, the rule was for them to terrify the tribes into submission. And so, by taking African wives, the Negroes and the black Portuguese brews multiplied exceedingly in Africa. As the following reference reads, and it reads, Many of the Portuguese men who colonized the Cape Verdean Islands migrated to nearby West Africa, where there were women, gold, ivory, food, and freedom from European kings and the Catholic Church. Most European immigrants lived in animist kingdoms along navigable rivers in the coastal rainforest rather than in Muslim kingdoms. However, European men traded with Islamic merchants. Skipping ahead. The absence of Portuguese women in the tropics resulted in Portuguese men having intimate relationships with African girls and women and fathering thousands of mulatto children in the polygamous African culture. And the next reference reads, Furthermore, there was confusion among Europeans in Africa because Portuguese law did not state the exact amount of time Cape Verde colonists could remain in West Africa before becoming illegal lancados. Although there is evidence that large numbers of Portuguese men and mulattoes lived in West Africa, the surviving data is insufficient to hazard a guess about their population. And so the sons of King Dawid multiplied and began to spread throughout West Africa. Before the first transatlantic slaves were sent from the west coast of Africa, the sons of King Dawid were well established. That is, until a series of historical events occurred that would change the world as we know it forever. First, King Manuel changed the trade policy for West Africa. Instead of using Lancados to conduct the trade, he switched to something else. And as a result, he no longer needed the Lancados. In fact, it meant that they were in the way. As the following reference reads, and it reads, things changed under King Manuel I. 
At the beginning of his reign, King Manuel did not lease trading rights with Gambia to Portuguese merchants or lancados, as he did with the rivers of Guinea and Sierra Leone. And so once King Emmanuel changed the way he made his money, he no longer needed the brews. In fact, they were in the way. And so on March 15th, 1518, the year the first slaves were shipped directly from Africa to America, he sent Bernadem Gomez to orchestrate a massive manhunt of Lancados. And he used the newly created law of King Manuel to do it. As the following reference reads, and it reads, King Manuel also had further threats in store for those Lancados who were already on the coast in large numbers. On the 15th of March, 1518, he commissioned Bernadem Gomez to sail to Guinea to superintend the removal of the Lancados. And the next reference reads, and it reads, the Crown at first encouraged the policy of having Lancados in this region to facilitate commerce. Degradados sailed on the voyages of both Vasco da Gama and Pedro Alvarez Cabral. Da Gama took 12 degradados with him and probably several in Southeast Africa. Once in place, it became clear that the Portuguese crown was unable to control them. In an effort to keep these regions free of non-Portuguese commercial activities, in 1518, the crown reversed the policy of creating Lancados and attempted to round them up. And the following reference reads, and it reads, finally, on March the 15th, 1518, he published a violent charter for which he sent a special ship commanded by Bernadem Gomez to the ports of Guinea with the mission of getting all the Christian Lancados who were there to board. Those who returned to Europe obeying this order would be forgiven as long as they paid the 10 cruzados along with half of their possessions or their farms. Those, however, who refuse to embark and to leave the lands of Africa would be handed over to the African kings to be killed. The permit authorized Captain Bernadem Gomez to offer to the indigenous chiefs all the gifts that were necessary to achieve the delivery or the murder of those Lancados. It seems that these violent measures by monarch Venturoso were intended to reach Jews and foreign adventurers who spread freely along the African coast. And so the law that was written just a few years before against the Lancados was now fully enforced and a worldwide decree was given to all of Portugal's allies in Africa and abroad. And the message was clear. Go, hunt them down and bring them to me, no matter where they are or how long it's been, find them. I hereby authorize everyone to hunt them, to take all their possessions. You have my permission. You can keep half of their possessions. Just bring the other half to me and bring them to me in chains. Bring them to the judges of Guinea as prisoners. And to all those looking for slaves, you can now purchase them from Africa, from the judges of Guinea, for they are now under the judgment of natural death.
That was a summary and a paraphrase of a law that's roughly 20 pages long. And with that being said, let's take a closer look at this law issued by King Manuel, who started the transatlantic slave trade and also started it from Africa. This is the law that's never taught in any institutions of learning. A copy of this law can be found in Portugal's National Library. And you can check the description of this video for a link of your very own copy of a non-translated copy. Now, this document is written in ancient Portuguese, which doesn't translate well in Google Translate. So with that being said, we were blessed to have the help of a kind, helpful sister, Ema, professor, perfectionist, uh, along with a professional translation company to review and certify these translations. And with that said, here are a few important excerpts from our translations. First, the law starts by stating the people of whom it is for. Researchers agree this law was written specifically for Lencados. We see this in books from the 1900s. We also note that this law describes the targeted people as being those sent and those who go to Guinea. This lines up with the groups of King Dawid's sons that we reviewed earlier in this video. Some were sent by way of the expulsion edicts and some fled on their own. Those are the ones who go to Guinea without the king's consent. So hopefully you can see this is just one big story that started in Spain and Portugal and made its way into Africa. As the following reference reads, and it reads, regarding those who are sent to Elmina or those who go to Guinea without the permission from the king, as well as those who do not comply with the rules. Here's a copy of the notes from one of our translators. These points have been validated using additional books and references. And it says, the fifth book is about the punishments or the ordinances for those that, one, went to Guinea with the consent of the king, but didn't keep his rules. Main crimes against the kingdom, they didn't keep the Catholic faith, they didn't pay taxes, or they had multiple wives. Point two, those that were sent to Guinea as punishment for not converting to the Catholic faith so they couldn't go back by their own will. They were required good behavior, but they would often incur the same crimes. Reparations were paid to the kingdom in silver, gold, merchandise, and labor. The law then goes on to summarize the reason for the law. And it reads, the ordinations and the laws which have thus far been created for things related to our town, Elmina, and for things related to Guinea, are not going well and are not being declared like they should. Therefore, our service needs to step up and help preserve the enforcement of laws, since we are suffering quite a bit. If we take action, such attitude will be useful to all our kingdoms and all the governors and landlords, and also help with the excommunications that have been going on in many kingdoms. However, many laws have not even been created or confirmed yet. This situation is generating a lot of confusion and questions. We need to show that we have the ability to govern properly. The laws that talk about our mind and what we managed to take away from Guinea were idealized by my uncle, King Alfonso, as well as my cousin, King John. Something which they should take a lot of credit for. In the following paragraph, we will write what the law must be. The law basically states that these people could not buy or sell in West Africa without first having written permission from Portugal. And if the Lancados or sons of King Dawid broke this law, the sentence involved turning over the lawbreakers to the Portuguese judges and being sentenced to natural death, a.k.a. slavery. As the following reference reads, and it reads, By law, we are ordering all people not to go out of our ships 
or go to other lands and seas or places that we have conquered with the objective of waging war or stealing things in our name. Such things should not be done without our permission. The person who does this shall be killed as punishment, which is natural death and slavery. The person who does this can also lose all their belongings and goods. This punishment also goes to all those people who attempt to steal things from our ships like machinery, mechanical parts or artillery. Those who are found wandering around other seas shall face the consequences. However, those who were found but have not done anything wrong shall be spared. We need to know all the information we can about the occurrences so we can order the correct punishment to be applied or not. And by this law of ours, we give place and license to all captains, pilots, masters, or landlords of our ships, or our keepers, or any other person of our kingdom, or landlords that those parts for their privilege or by our permission they go. We here state the permission to go to those places and every ship, land, seas, that they find, they are allowed to take them and bring all the people they find as prisoners. And as a message to those who defile us will be delivered to our judge of Guinea, which is the West Coast of Africa. And by him be judge, half of what they had will be divided by those who brought them and the other half will be ours. And last but not least, the same law that authorized the taking of these people also authorized for the first time the taking of slaves from the West Coast of Africa. As the following reference reads and it reads, we are also certified to give permission to the captains of our ships and to order them to go to Elmina or to Sao Tome and to precip islands to trade and to negotiate. However, a trip to Sao Tome and Princip islands should be taken when it is really necessary. There our ships might have the possibility of buying many slaves to bring to our kingdoms as well as other things that can be purchased. Ladies and gentlemen, this law written by the King of Portugal is the actual law that started the transatlantic slave trade from Africa to the Americas. It is a law written specifically for Lancados, who are black Portuguese, who are Spanish Jews, who are Negroes, who are the sons of King Dawid. For the first time in modern history, we have uncovered the greatest secret of the transatlantic slave trade. This is history in the making. Well, House of Judah, a major piece of your history has now been restored back unto you. It is now time to turn back to the Most High Yah and to once again be Israel. And let Abba Yah be your Elohim, for Yahuwah is his name. This is just the beginning, family. There's much, much more to this. We must now prepare for our journey home. And with that, this lesson has come to an end. A special thank you for all those who continue to lift me and my family up in your thoughts and prayers. And a big thank you to those who donate to help make these videos possible. I thank you on behalf of all the viewers who are enlightened by these videos. And thank you to all those who share these videos with family and friends. Well, family, stay blessed, Israel and prepare for the long journey home. Shalom.